good afternoon morning or evening everyone and welcome to the eu non-proliferation and disarmament conference 2023 uh, many thanks for accepting our invitation my name is ettore greco i'm a, the executive vice president of the international affairs institute and the director of the Institute uh, program on multilateralism and global governance. I'm very glad to open the 12th edition of this annual conference. Uh, my institute has been in charge of organizing uh, this conference in the last six years. Uh, the conference uh, is part uh, of a multi-year project funded by the European Union on non-proliferation and disarmament, which started 13 years ago in 2010, thanks to a EU Council decision. The project is implemented by a consortium of six uh, research centers, which also include FRS in Paris, IS, IISS in London, PRIF in Frankfurt, the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, and CIPRI in Stockholm. CIPRI is responsible for the project's uh, overall direction and management. The consortium carries out uh, its activities in close coordination with the European External Action Service, the European Commission, and other European institutions. And I wish very much to thank them on the behalf of consortium for their fundamental support uh, and advice. The central task of the consortium is, in a word, to foster the academic research and strategic debate about non-proliferation and disarmament challenges, in particular discussing and making suggestions about what can be done to make the European strategies and policies more effective. To fulfill this mission, the consortium has promoted a consolidated and wide network of more than 100 European study centers dealing with non-proliferation and disarmament or broader security issues. Zibille Bauer, chair of the consortium, who will speak immediately after me, will give you further details about the consortium's activities uh, and achievements uh, and its latest developments uh, and future plans. Let me say a few words about today's conference. Its overall objective is to provide a forum where independent scholars and experts from Europe and outside Europe can share fresh analysis and ideas with EU government officials and representatives of international organizations. This is well reflected, I believe, in the mixed profiles of the conference panelists. And I would like to express our deepest thanks to all speakers Several come from outside Europe for being with us today. In the non-proliferation and disarmament field, the European Union has consistently tried to advocate and support multilateral solution in line with its wider multilateralist approach to security. The EU strategy is centered on preserving the existing promoting their universalization and effective implementation, as well as innovative mechanisms and agreements to keep up with new challenges. Advancing this agenda has become, however, more and more difficult. Multilateral, multilateral principles have been increasingly contested and undermined. We have witnessed a continued erosion of uh, arms control architecture, a trend which has recently accelerated. The security system built in the Cold War and subsequent decades is being uh, dismantled. The key question is how to react to this trend. This implies discussing the causes of the collapse of some key arms control agreements, its consequences and the concrete prospects for renewing non-proliferation and disarmament efforts. Of course, this goes without saying, 
arms control problems cannot be discussed in isolation. We need to look at the dramatically changed strategic landscape, which is now characterized by entrenched rivalries and mistrust among big powers and new conflictual dynamics and wars. To be sure, the crisis of arms control goes far back to Russian's aggression against Ukraine. The INF Treaty, for instance, was dismantled in 2019, as you know. But as a matter of fact, the security regional order in Europe is now in shambles. Russia withdrawal from the Treaty on Conventional Forces in Europe has been just the last episode. And it is difficult to figure out uh, even a system limited to confidence and building measures uh, could it be rebuilt on the continent. The Israel-Hamas war poses new daunting challenges. The risk that regional rivalries in the Middle East give rise to a destabilizing arms race had already deepened in the last few decades, exacerbated by the failure to revive the Iran nuclear deal. The ongoing war has uh, a high potential to transform into a wider regional conflict with global repercussions. This makes the risk of arm, arms races and nuclear proliferation in the Middle East even more pressing. A third major source of concern are territorial disputes and related military build-ups in the Indo-Pacific region, where no agreement for new structural measures to build trust and increase military transparency is at the moment in sight. In all three regions, a stable security environment can only emerge from a mix of credible deterrent postures and functional arms control agreements. There are, however, growing doubts that the United States has the capabilities needed to be an effective security provider on so many fronts. This makes it, an, it even more essential that Europe pushes for multilateral solution involving as many actors as possible, supporting peacemaking, peacemaking with all the means at its disposal. This requires strengthening the cooperation links between the EU and international organizations such as NATO and UN. The implementation of the UN agenda in particular has been an overarching objective of the EU strategy. In this era of growing strategic rivalries, the three largest nuclear powers have long embarked on extensive nuclear modernization plans. Uncontrolled nuclear build-up activities can be devastating for global security, but also for the future of the non-proliferation regime. Even after Russia's and then US decision this year to suspend implementation of the New START, a top priority remains the launch of bilateral talks for the entry into force of a new strategic arms control treaty when New START expires in 2026. The proposal put forward by the US in July this year to create a framework to continue applying limitation to strategic nuclear weapons developments is a welcome move, although such agreement seems unlikely as long as Russia's war on Ukraine continues. As always, it is difficult to negotiate on arms control issues separated from strategic disputes. The chances to extend strategic talks to other nuclear powers remain very small. It is, however, a positive sign that the US and Chinese officials recently met to discuss arms control issues for the first time since the Obama administration. More pro promising appears the prospect for intensifying engagement of the P5 on nuclear uh, risk reduction. In a period of heightening tensions between nuclear powers, it is essential to minimize the risks of miscalculation and inadvertent escalation, and the P5 could still provide perhaps a functional framework for that. A key role in risk reduction can also be played in particular by the Hague Code of Conduct 
for seeing prior notification of ballistic missile launches. These general strategic issues will be at the center, in particular, of the conference uh, uh, last plenary session. But we will start uh, in this afternoon first plenary session to discuss how the EU is implementing its non-proliferation and disarmament agenda, how it can update and strengthen its diplomatic, technical, and financial means and become a more effective actor in the arms control forums. This will be followed by a discussion on the non-proliferation regime with a focus on the result of this year NPT, NPT preparatory committee meeting and other recent developments. We will also have the great privilege to discuss the prospect of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty with Robert Floyd, Executive Secretary of the Preparatory Commission for the CTBTO. Another plenary session tomorrow morning will be specifically uh, devoted uh, to tomorrow afternoon to, this, to the lessons and implication of the Ukraine war. Tomorrow morning we will have two sets of three parallel sessions, six in total, covering a wide range of issues. The state of play and prospect of non-proliferation and disarmament regimes, such as the Chemical and Biological Weapons Conventions, the emerging threats, militarization of outer space, biotechnology, lethal autonomous weapons, and what new arms control initiatives can be undertaken to counter them. A session, we, uh, parallel session will focus on the issue of diversion or conventional arms, which is one of the most daunting security challenges, uh, and also the state of implementation of uh, the arms trade treaty. These are, as you know, uh, at the center of the EU arms control uh, diplomacy of the European Union. There will be also a session on the rapidly evolving security situation in East Asia and the related risk and opportunity for cooperation. This is a rich and admittedly demanding program. I hope it will provide the opportunity for an extensive and stimulating exchange of insights, views and knowledge so that we can make a concrete contribution to the advancement of strategic thinking. I wish once again to thank all panelists and all of you for taking part in today's conference and I very much look forward to our debate in these one and a half days. Thanks for your attention. I have now the great pleasure to give the floor to Sibylle Bauer, Director of Study on the Disarmament and the Armament and Disarmament at CIPRI and Head of our Consortium. Sibylle, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ettore. A very warm welcome also from CIPRI on behalf of the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium. Thanks to the very generous support from the EU for now over 12 years, we have been able to set up a network of independent non-proliferation and disarmament think tanks, now comprising over 110 entities from all across Europe, every single EU member state, and six other European countries, including Ukraine. The network includes research institutes and university departments. It thus also bridges the gap between academia and the policy research world. And it also includes a mix of technical, natural sciences and also social science disciplines, which is also a very important gap to be bridged. Many of our network members are here in the audience today. Um, thank you very much for coming here. I'm very happy that we have thus managed to create a European community of thinkers in the non-proliferation and disarmament and arms control world. Going back to our mandate based on the EU Council decision, we are to encourage political and security related dialogue, to raise awareness of proliferation and disarmament challenges, and to develop expertise and institutional capacity on these issues in think tanks and governments in Europe and beyond, 
And I think you will all agree with me that this is now more important than ever, given the current state of the world today. So to give a brief overview of some of the tools and activities that we have at our disposal, we can make the very rich and very diverse expertise of the network available to EU policymakers through instruments such as an annual consultative meeting, which is similar to this, but with European participation. We organize ad hoc seminars on a range of very specific topics, most recently a couple of weeks ago on export control issues. And we are also invited to do written and oral ad hoc briefings to EU bodies. But our mandate goes beyond the EU, as you can also see with the audience here at this meeting. And uh, we also organize a number of other activities that are more broadly and more international, including organizing the Brussels study visit of the UN Disarmament Fellows. A major overarching goal has also been on behalf of the consortium to increase gender balance throughout our activities and more broadly also to increase diversity of geography, disciplines in academia and age. And those of you who have been following the consortium and the network for some time will notice that we've made good progress on that, but there's still more progress to be made, of course. And in this context, I'm particularly pleased to welcome among us 20 participants of our Young Women Next Generation program and also the speakers of the Next Generation workshop that took place this morning. I should also say that the mentees and the speakers of the Next Gen workshop were selected from a very large pool of very qualified applicants, so it was a very competitive process. Congratulations to you all. And since I attended the meeting this morning, the Next Gen meeting was fantastic, high, very high standard, very insightful. Thank you. Our other activities for Next Generation also include funded internships, which is very important, and a non-proliferation training course for the natural sciences. And we just had over 20 young engineering students um, from all over Europe in Stockholm last week for our most recent course. In, also in our education portfolio, we have the e-learning courses, and I hope many of you have already discovered those. They're available for anybody for free, and they cover the full range of uh, non-proliferation disarmament arms control issues. And we've also more recently made av available teaching resources for professors who would like to teach a broader range of non-proliferation disarmament issues or who would like to make their teaching more diverse by including a wider range of sources. And finally, our network experts have produced now over a, a total of 86 EU policy papers, which are also available for anybody who would like to download them. They cover, again, the whole range of issues, nuclear, chem, bio, missiles, outer space, gender perspectives, conventional, small arms and light weapons, so on and so forth, emerging tech. So I'm sure there's something for everybody. And the latest edition is our podcast series, for those of you who haven't found it yet. And if you'd like to find out more, do subscribe to the newsletter, which our Italian colleagues uh, produce, uh, or visit the website, where a lot of that information is available. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Josep Borel. Due to his busy schedule, he's not available to be with us in person, so he's prepared a video message. And as you know, he's the EU's High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy. With that, thank you very much, and over to the video message. Distinguished guests, the paradigms of the global and European security architecture have changed drastically. You know it. In Europe, our security has been threatened by Russia's illegal and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, but the negative effects are global, also affecting the existing non-proliferation and disarmament agreements. In the past years, we have seen Russia withdrawing from multilateral approaches, suspending the new START Treaty, withdrawing from the Treaty on Conventional Forces in Europe, and de-ratifying the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. In addition, Russia often blocks work in other non-proliferation and disarmament fora, holding the international community hostage. More and more isolated, 
Russia is not the only challenger. There are others. And regional conflicts and crises, Gaza, Iran, North Korea, only add to the damage of the system and increase polarization. Many third states around the world tell us that they don't want to take sides and claim that they are trapped between narrative. And for the European Union, it's not just a battle of narratives, but a battle of values and our belief on multilateralism. We have many fields to cover, nuclear, biological and chemical weapons, the arms trade treaty, or the confidence on disarmament. And we are engaged to counter the illegal trade in small arms and light weapons, to preserve a safe and secure outer space, and to stem the development of lethal autonomous weapon systems. We are isolating Russia and fighting its deadly disinformation. We are engaged in China while speaking out against some of its narrative, its nuclear build-up and lack of transparency, and we are reaching out to like-minded and non-allied states to join forces to preserve together the multilateral framework. This conference is a testimony to a very close working relationship of the European Union with like-minded states and organizations, but also with think tanks, with civil society and the next generation. We are facing strong headwinds, and in facing them, we must continue our work and find new solutions. I hope that your discussion will result in new efforts to advance international non-proliferation and disarmament agenda. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Everts. I'm the recently appointed uh, director of the EU Institute for uh, Security Studies. Um, and I think that after these very uh, impressive uh, opening set of remarks, you know, it's now time now to delve a little more into the details of the issues and to yeah, develop these themes that have been touched on. And what is really the relationship between a multilateral system that is needed more than ever before, but is also struggling? Because it's struggling because it, it doesn't take place in a vacuum and this world of power politics that we deal with every day is of course affecting all our work on non-proliferation, arms control and, uh, and disarmament. Um, I'm very glad also that this is not only an intra-European discussion. Huh? Uh, by design and on purpose we have a broader set of, uh, of participants. So, they have been set exam questions. We'll see how much, uh, as, as a moderator, you never know, huh? but you set them a, a little bit in advance. We've invited the colleagues here to essentially address three sort of uh, questions from different angles, and they represent different professional backgrounds. You know, really, what do they assess as the core strengths, but also limitations or, or weaknesses of, of the EU uh, non-proliferation uh, and arms uh, control and disarmament agenda. I mean, in a very plural world, in a contested world, what should the EU focus on? What, what can we do that others can't? What, what, what is the added value, really, of the European Union? That's the first sort of question. Um, the second question is, what's really this balance between, on the one hand, upholding, defending uh, the existing multilateral non-proliferation of arms control regime, regimes, um, and to what extent should we also address new emerging issues, gaps, uh, and what's the, what's the balance between these two, and how do you do this best? Um, and then finally, uh, looking a bit beyond uh, these horizontal approaches, what in particular parts of the world, be it in the Middle East, be it in Africa, be it in Asia or the Indo-Pacific, should be the EU's priorities? What's the message that it should carry working with partners uh, to take that forward? Now, to delve into those questions, we have a fantastic panel. Um, you have the uh, indications on the programs. We have Carlos Aragon from the Spanish MFA, and if everybody knows, of course, it's the final stretch of the council uh, presidency of, uh, of Spain, and I want to salute their energy and their commitment and you know, advancing the really much the European interests um, uh, in, in this domain. Um, we have to my uh, right, Carla Pabellina. She's uh, head of the Strategic, Territorial and Maritime Issue Center 
section of the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies in the Philippines of the Philippine Foreign Service Institute and also Associate Fellow of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network from Manila. Thank you very much for taking the plane and coming all the way here. Uh, I think that's very much appreciated. We have a bit further on Peter Wagner, who is the uh, Director of the Foreign Policy Instrument Service of the European Commission. Um, we work, for those who don't know, in extremely close partnership uh, with them. Uh, and they help us in very concrete ways achieve help the EU achieve its, uh, uh, its goals also in this domain. So I look very much forward to hear from Peter how he sees the agenda moving forward. And we have also to my uh, left, uh, Megan D. Right? She comes from the University of Stirling, so a bit more of sort an of academic perspective, policymaking perspective. We have insiders, outsiders, Europeans and others. Without further ado, I I'm going to follow, if, if that's okay with my uh, colleagues, I'm going to follow just the order here. I have asked them to limit their remarks to 40, uh, 10 minutes, so 40 overall. No, no, hang on, hang on, 10 minutes each. Yeah? Um, because I want to then uh, turn to yourselves, uh, so already when you hear the comments, you know, Start preparing your, your, your questions, your comments, your uh, contributions. We'll turn to those later. But first, Carlos, tell us, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. It's a pleasure to be here, seeing so many colleagues, friends, mentors, and so. So, yeah, it's a matter of pride. So, thank you very much. Uh, also, thank you very much to the consortium for organizing uh, this annual conference. Uh, especially in a week like this week, where it's almost, I think, it's 20 years to the day of the approval of the U.S. strategy and so, so I think it's very timely. And apart from being very timely, I think it's good that we have like a wider perspective, that is not only EU member states talking about ourselves, but that we have academia, colleagues from other regions, because that will help us to, to get probably a more realistic uh, a view of uh, what we have been doing, where we want to go, and how to improve. So I think that's a uh, that's, uh, very good initiative. So, so yeah, so I'm happy to be here. So first, uh, first question, uh, what are the EU, EU's core strengths and limitations in non-proliferation and disarmament field? Uh, actually, uh, most of our planning to say, and I will say anyhow, has been said by the High Representative Borrell, so I will not dare to go against his, uh, <laughs> his, uh, his remarks and so, but uh, for me it's very clear, even if it's very obvious, but I think it's worthwhile to underline that, that the main strength of the EU when it comes to the fight against proliferation and for disarmament is the commitment at the highest level for this fight. I mean, we have seen it in the in the words of uh, of Borrell. So I think that from this high level commitment uh, flows the whole um, EU strong political, technical, and financial support for all the system of non proliferation and disarmament. Uh, I mean, as I said, the the EU strategy is already twenty years old, uh, but. I think still very relevant, and also I want to underline that the fight against proliferation uh, has been reaffirmed in the basic European strategic documents like the strategic compass, which, as it has been said, stresses that the EU will uphold, support, and further advance the support for effective multilateralism. Um, so, uh, first uh, idea, is that the support, political support uh, of the EU to the whole system of non-proliferation and disarmament is based on our, uh, on our support for uh, effective multilateralism to the development and of an open rules-based international order based on human rights, fundamental freedoms, universal laws, and international law. I think that's uh, the key for our political support. Uh, apart from the global, uh, from the strategic compass, I think I have to mention also the global strategy for the Union's foreign and security policy, which also calls and defends and confirms the EU support for universalization, full implementation and enforcement of, uh, of the multilateral architecture and disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control. Um, 
But, uh, I mean, that doesn't happen in the vacuum. Uh, we are in a very challenging international situation right now. So um, what we have to see as EU, as member states, is how to adapt the mandate, the guidelines of these strategic papers to this new situation. And I think the first point, again, is to uh, reinforce the existing system. The EU has been very vocal in uh, and continues to be very vocal in supporting technical organizations, IAEA, OPCW, uh, CTVT Prepcom, um, all the instruments. Uh, we have been very vocal in the MPT. Uh, we are strong defenders of uh, the safeguards regime of the IEA through the Comprehensive Savers Agreement, universalization of the additional protocol, and so on. Um, I mean, I don't want to make a shopping list of all the instruments, but uh, what I think everybody should, or we should be very clear, is that the preservation of the architecture as it is, is essential in times of crisis. Um, so I think that political support is one of the, for the institutional framework is one of the strengths of the EU. Uh, but also is the very conscious uh, support which goes beyond the institutional framework, which is the support to civil society. Uh, we have been very vocal in international discussions in the last few years in defending the participation, the active participation of civil society in non-proliferation disarmament fora. Uh, also, the focus on gender issue, uh, gender issues, sorry, uh, youth. I mean, it was mentioned the Next Generation program uh, organized by the EU Consortium, which I think it's uh, essential, and for the EU is essential to support these programs in order to uh, keep on creating the expertise which is needed to advance uh, in the field of non-proliferation disarmament. Also, I mean, being an event organized by the EU consortium, uh, mentioning education for disarmament is also basic. I mean, just as an example, I think the uh, courses, seminars, the online materials organized by the EU consortium are extremely helpful to, to advance the, the cause of non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, but apart from all the political support, very comprehensive at all levels, um, I think uh, what I am particularly proud as a European member state is that the EU, let's say, we, we walk the talk. Uh, we don't just stick to our political commitments, as important as they are, but uh, we give a strong financial support to organizations uh, to the whole machinery, and so uh, I was checking the, the web page to be sure, as we are discussing during the week also the next council decisions. Uh, since 2004, the EU has financed more than 125 projects uh, worth more than 370 million euros. I think that's something that uh, we should be proud of, but also it should set the baseline that we should aspire to, to improve. Also, uh, it's very important that this political, technical, financial support has a strong focus on capacity building, training, facilitating the participation of delegates from the Global South in the in international meetings of non-proliferation and disarmament. That help also to have as many voices as possible heard and incorporated into this uh, into this machinery. Um, so I think that would be those would be my points for the which would be the US trends. Uh, when it comes to to talk about the well the weaknesses or the limitations, mm, it reminds me a little bit of the classical question in job interviews, uh, which are your weaknesses? Uh, I will not say that I'm a perfectionist because obviously it's not the case. Uh, and I think the European Union shouldn't aspire either to be perfect, it should aspire to be efficient. So uh, probably one of the limitations that might be on everyone's minds is the, the different views within the EU. 
I will come back to that later, but it's true that sometimes I understand that for partners in other regions of the world, might be difficult to, to understand what the EU is thinking, because the EU is not thinking just one thing, it has different views. I, well, I'm playing a little bit devil's advocate here. I think that, um, um, I mean, I understand that these messages might be perceived as confusing, contradictory, weak. Sometimes we are accused, let's say, of have been very uh, soft even. Uh, but, uh, but well, that something is one of the characteristics of the EU, one of the difficulties which uh, can be, I think, as we I, I will explain, talk later, I think it can be turned also into, into an advantage. And another weakness, and I think that uh, panels like this one can be very helpful to address that, is the we have to be more uh, proactive and interactive in dialogue with uh, other regions in the world. We have to be aware that our uh, interests, our visions, as valid as uh, good they might be, they are not necessarily the same as those in other parts of the world. And we have to make an effort to understand those other visions in order to better integrate and try to and try to move forward. So as I'm starting to talk a little bit too long, I mean I think that yes. takes us to the next yeah. question that how how can the EU enhance its role in preserving and strengthening the existing regimes and so? I mean, I think at this stage it's pretty, I mean, the answer should be pretty, pretty basic, basic to explain, very difficult to implement, which is to build on our strengths, specifically the strong technical, political and financial support to the architecture, and try to revert uh, all those uh, limitations or weaknesses. In the case of the lack of uh, sometimes common vision within the EU, which might be clearer for it, if we use the example of uh, nuclear issues, I mean, I think, of course, as a weakness, but at the same time, I think that plays the EU and its member states in a very good position to try to build bridges. Uh, we are in a moment of crisis now. There's many different visions about uh, how to advance nuclear disarmament. So the fact that some of their visions are within the EU, uh, personally, I think that put us in a very good place to try to, to, try to understand and to try to uh, integrate all these visions in trying to, to advance. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I don't, I don't know what else. I mean, uh, again, I'm very curious to hear about the um, what others perceive about the our weaknesses and so because that will help us a lot also when we decide uh, what to do and how to move forward and so. So yeah, and basically, very briefly, just. To yeah. touch also on the on your last question, uh, what should be our I mean the use position on proliferation issues in conflict conflictual regions? I mean I think uh, I mean first obviously uh, we have to be very careful to try to apply a kind of a one size fits all template to all to all proliferation crises. I mean they have uh, they have very different roots very different dynamics. So uh, one thing that the EU, I think, is quite good at doing is to adapt, to analyze, and to try to uh, to find specific solutions for specific problems. And there also, um, more of the position, what the EU can do, I think what it's already trying to do, uh, for example, in the, in the GCPOA, I mean, even if it's uh, the situation in the GCPOA is not the best we could have, uh, the diplomatic support, the uh, political support that the EU gave to the process, the role of the high representative and his team, uh, that has proven that uh, there's a way to solve diplomatically uh, kind of apparently unsolvable uh, proliferation crises. The fact that even in this uh, very difficult time, uh, diplomatic channels are still 
trying to find solutions to to the Iranian Iranian nuclear file, I think it's a good example of the tools that the EU can use and can adapt to different situations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, I think, a very stellar, uh, comprehensive overview of the strengths, the commitments, uh, the record of the European Union, also some of the challenges, some of our own complexities and what they mean for our partnerships. I think it's very uh, fortunate that we have uh, uh, non-EU uh, speakers with us. Because, you know, we sometimes in Brussels, we come up with beautiful policy designs, but, but how does it look to you, uh, Carla May? And, and, and what would you advise us to do differently or better? Feel free uh, to share with us uh, your perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank this opportunity to express my sincerest thanks to the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium, particularly to Dr. Greco of the International Affairs Institute for inviting me in this conference. Um, it is a great privilege for me to engage with you distinguished delegates and experts on this very important issue. Before I continue, I would like to note that I'm speaking on my personal capacity and not officially representing the Asia Pacific Leadership Network or the Philippine government. Just to be clear. So, the EU engagement, and I'm speaking from the perspective of Southeast Asia or ASEAN. So the EU's engagement with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations celebrated a critical milestone. So in 2020, the long-standing ASEAN-EU dialogue partnership elevated into a strategic partnership. The ASEAN-EU Plan of Action 2023-2028, which was adopted in the ASEAN-EU post-ministerial conference, further affirmed cooperation on disarmament, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, arms control, and peaceful uses of nuclear energy as key areas of ASEAN-EU interaction. So the EU's support for ASEAN's efforts to preserve Southeast Asia as a region free from nuclear weapons and all forms of weapons of mass destruction manifests in its active participation in the ASEAN Regional Forum intercessional meetings on non-proliferation and disarmament. There is also the provision of technical support to the ASEAN network of regulatory bodies on atomic energy, the ASEAN TOM, which is basically a copy of the Eurotom. Engagement also with the network of ASEAN CBRN defense experts and the conduct of capacity building and experts in change through the EU CBRN risk mitigation centers of excellence in Southeast Asia. More specifically, the European Commission supported the establishment of the Regional Early Warning Radiation Monitoring Network and the Radiational Exchange Platform to allow for the exchange of data between the national networks in Southeast Asia. Technical support to enhance the quality of decision making within ASEAN with regard to radiological and nuclear energy were also provided through the installations of state of the art uh, decision making tools which support, uh, example, the decision making of the government and the radiolog radiological like, uh, uh, agencies within emergency centers. The EU CBR and risk mitigation centers with the regional secretariat hosted in Manila supports the mitigation and the preparedness against CBRN through enhancing intra-regional and multi-agency coordinations. Um, the activities conducted within this center of excellence include needs and risk assessment, capacity building activities, legal framework review, tabletop and field exercises, exchange views. So um, even as we continue existing initiatives, I hope that the ASEAN and EU can further advance cooperation towards achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Ultimately, I think that the costs of arms control and disarmament may be better served if the regions work together.
And going back to the questions of what can EU do more, actually, I've I read it some of it already. I think a strengthened support for the ASEAN Tom, which is critical in the development of a regional nuclear safety regime that strengthens the Sianfest Treaty verification is very important. This is in accordance to a provision of control system. So far, we haven't had that. So the control system comprises of AIA. IAEA safeguard systems, the report and exchange of information, request for clarification, which is basically the verification system of the Sianfest Treaty. Apart from that, I think ASEAN would also appreciate EU support and cooperation, as I mentioned, peaceful uses of nuclear energy. The countries in Southeast Asia are looking into small modular reactors and applications including floating nuclear power plants for combined heat and power generations to support offshore and um, onshore and offshore industrial clusters. However, um, public acceptance and the high cost remain key impediments for the implementations of uh, these civilian nuclear energy programs. EU support or participation could help improve competition in these technologies, further enhance compliance to the relevant regulations, and reduce dependence risk. The, there's also some studies, and the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific had CSCAP, had one, one session on this, on prospects of converting existing fossil fuel facilities for nuclear power generations. So these are currently being studied, if I'm not mistaken, in Poland and also in China. However, while seemingly advantageous um, initial capital costs compared to new power plants, there might be some uh, challenges in terms of upskilling, security, and other proliferation risks. Therefore, there might be a need to study all of this, and further assessment with the support of you might be quite useful. So that's, I think, what I wanted to say. Thank you very, very much, um, both for your uh, recalling the, the various ways in which uh, the European Union and ASEAN uh, are already and have worked together in this domain for, for a number of years and the kind of outcomes that have already been achieved. But also, and, uh, and it's very nice um, to, to, to hear from you, your perspective, what, what could lie next? Eh? Uh, the ideas around uh, uh, strength and support for ASEAN TOM, uh, can we do more on the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy? Thank you very much uh, for, for your, um, your introductory remarks. Um, maybe I can now turn to Peter Wagner and, and give him uh, the floor to share the perspective from the European Commission of this entire agenda. Please, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for the organizers uh, from the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium and uh, IAI, who are trustworthy friends in this work that we are doing. Uh, let me start by uh, beginning where the High Representative uh, already was, and that is to also recall the difficult environment in which we are currently doing that, because we are seeing, notably through Russia, at the moment, of course, numerous uh, efforts to disrupt the current existing order. And that, uh, he listed already many of them, so I think I can skip that part, but uh, that not only when it comes to nuclear. I think uh, one of the also more recent events was in May this year, when Russia prevented the fifth review conference of the Chemical Weapons Convention to reach consensus on the final document. And you really, if you start looking there, looking in neighbor areas, you're seeing uh, how Russia and some others are having a certain pattern. Now, having said this, of course, I'd like to come to where uh, we as the EU are, where we are having our strengths and uh, of course, I say, uh, despite the lack of self-criticism, something on limitations. Um, I think on the strength, some of the elements have already been mentioned. Um, and it's maybe without sounding too pathetic there, but the multilateralism is part of the EU's DNA because we are many states working together. So for us, that is the natural, normal habitat in which we are moving, where we are looking uh, for progress. And that is where I think uh, for more than 70 years, the EU created as a peace project and all of that things, which sometimes maybe people overlook. Uh, it's important to recall that. It's also important to recall that, that despite um, the ambassador mentioned that, of course, we have numerous member states which are not always exactly saying the same things. 
but at the overall, we are all working with all the member states and all the institutions towards the same main objectives. And that, I think, is what makes us strong, because we are used to, uh, in such a multilateral environment, also to adapt and uh, to learn from it. Um, before saying maybe a few examples of that we are also, and that's one of our strengths, putting the money where our mouth is, let me still say a few words about the limitations first. And I think the limitation is to some degree coming from our strength. Because since we are bringing together many member states uh, behind, underneath, with the institutions, uh, it makes it sometimes for us difficult to act quickly, to act as strongly and clearly as some of the other actors in this arena might be able to do. And that's something we have to keep in mind. Now, coming back to some of the, um, and, and maybe apologies, and, and maybe on the limitations, let's not be too limited. Um, it's also, of course, because of the many interests that we are representing, we sometimes tend to spread our efforts uh, in a maybe too wide field. Uh, and some of you might uh, struggle to see the focus. Um, having said this, um, we are doing a lot. We are, as I said, putting our money where our mouth is. Um, we can start from, uh, and that's also then maybe going into the question of how do we work outside the EU, where could we more do when it comes to uh, proliferation issues in other conflict areas uh, beyond the normal work. I think it is very important to recall that we are really very systematically for a long time and uh, substantially supporting numerous organizations. And that is very important because without these organizations, some of them would struggle. The Commission uh, for the uh, Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, we went in with around 6 million euro. The uh, more recently now a new action to support the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the Chemical Weapons Convention, where we are in again with another 5 million euro now. Uh, we are very actively supporting projects, and that means financial support when it comes to the Hague uh, Code of Conduct against ballistic missile proliferation. We have a number of other activities, International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, Biological and Toxin Weapon Conventions, the Arms Trade uh, Treaty Secretariat, etc. I think that is very important to recall that kind of institutional support. We are, however, also doing it bilaterally in a number of areas. We are no surprise uh, since the outbreak of the full-scale Russian invasion in Ukraine, we are supporting Ukraine on a number of CBRN-related uh, activities to protect the population, to detect uh, possible, possible threats, and to deal with them. And we are also uh, among the main supporters when it comes to humanitarian demining. That is in a country where possibly up to a third of the uh, the surface of the country is at the risk of being mine contaminated. Uh, that is quite a huge task, and we are also there trying to really help and come in. Let me still give you a few examples on where we are having the very regional targeted uh, initiatives uh, in place and where we are working on. Um, I already mentioned that we are supporting the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Now, what we're also doing was we were leading diplomatically and then also with all the related uh, support, the efforts on the conclusion of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran's nuclear program uh, was already referred to. We are in a number of uh, multilateral regional initiatives active there. Uh, a lot is, um, and maybe now we really go into another sub-element that is where we are increasingly worried in some regions, that's the illicit proliferation of small arms and light weapons, something that clearly has then also, when it comes to what is rolling back into Europe, having a huge uh, direct impact on us, where we are active. And that is inter alia demonstrated in the now renewed support that we are giving to the ITRACE project that is implemented by Conflict Armament Research, where we are really trying to make the tools available where the people on the ground can work uh, against the further proliferation of uh, weapons and, and, and armaments. 
We have a, a number of other activities. Now, since it was mentioned, uh, I'd like to stress that we are with a number of activities supporting the International Atomic Energy Agency, because that again is for us, to, to, to conclude that, uh, one of the domains where through institution, to the strengthening of institutions, we really try to play our role in helping to provide the overall framework in which these actions, uh, such activities can happen. Uh, allow me maybe to conclude by really recalling for us, the multilateralism, for us, the search for peaceful solutions is our DNA. That's at the heart of what we do and how we do it. And that is also what we then are trying to support, including financially. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I thought that was uh, very compelling, uh, setting out the geopolitical context and, and uh, stressing very much that the EU works at the multilateral level, it works at the regional level, it works at the bilateral level, but above all, it works at the multilateral level. Um, and, and to illustrate that thesis with an array, an impressive array of very targeted, very specific activities uh, that are being conducted. And also, yeah, all this requires money. And if it's, if it's not funded, it won't happen, right? So, and this is one of the things that the European Union can say with a straight face that it's been doing. Um, I think it's really time now to turn to Megan, Megan D, uh, to give us your perspective on how you see the EU's role in all of this. And then, as mentioned earlier, it's very much the time for, for the audience to, to come in. So, but first, uh, Megan, tell me, how does it look to you? Thank you. Well, um, thank you, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. I'm, I suppose my task is to bring a bit of an academic perspective to the panel. Um, so we were, as, as you know, asked to reflect on some homework, on homework questions. So the first was, what are the EU's core strengths and limitations? And that is a question, really, that has... Um, that academia, we in academia have spent a good deal of time addressing, um, particularly where it concerns nuclear matters. So I will limit my comments primarily to the nuclear field, if, if that's okay. Um, in fact, in academia, we can trot off a now fairly well-established list of EU strengths and weaknesses, particularly as it relates to EU performance in multilateral negotiations and in its engagement with third countries. So in terms of its strengths, um, we frequently talk about how the EU is lauded for its leadership potential, its market power that enables it to influence third countries, particularly through the use of its non-proliferation clause, its persistent championing of multilateral treaties and agreements. Um, and again, this echoing of the phrases of a few, a few of the panellists today, this, the fact that the EU's unique makeup as um, a polity of both nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states is also been very high, very much highlighted in the scholarship around this as, um, for the EU being something of a, a microcosm, the, yeah. the commonly quoted, um, of the wider MPT community. It's a benchmark for others to follow. Um, it's a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly I think any, any EU position concerning nuclear weapons especially is one that third countries tend to pay attention to largely because it is consensus-based language, which is hard to come by these days, and has passed the rigours of the EU's very extensive internal coordination <laughs> processes. <Very> um, extensive. <laughs> but um, yeah. performance analyses of the EU yeah. in nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament affairs don't tend to focus much on the abilities of, um, EU's ability to wield market power, normative power, or, or its championing of multilateralism, when we're doing performance analysis, we tend to look at the weaknesses mm -hmm. um, and the EU's lack of um, um, its divisions, its lack of competence, its lack of influence, where it concerns particularly its capacity to act in multilateral negotiation environments. And divisions are often, often um, focused on the, the divisions over nuclear disarmament especially, but also over nuclear energy. They're fixated on um, and because they are what produce the EU's lowest common denominator positions. Um, positions that often say little beyond what the most conservative of EU member states will allow. And that then reduces the EU's ambition to do more in multilateral environments. It reduces its flexibility to act and it demands that the EU spends more time coordinating with itself for the sake of EU unity than in negotiating with others. I'm an academic, so I can say these things without being punished. <laughs> Don't hold that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But really what this highlights, though, and I think that contrast between strengths and weaknesses, is that the EU is perpetually caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Because on the one hand, it's being lauded for its ability to negotiate a common position at all, especially on nuclear matters, and therefore expectations of its potential to do more with it, and then lamented for that same position, which seemingly limits it from doing so. Saying that, academic research obviously goes further than that. We don't just stop there. Um, and we are sort of, the, the, the research is sort of looking at what the EU both is and can be doing in the field, and particularly, forgive me for um, flag-waving my own research here, um, yeah. I wanted to particularly draw my draw attention to the parts of EU external action which I think r have remained relatively unsung. Um, and I recently, I've just argued this, that in fact, largely despite, yet in fact largely because of EU divisions and limitations as an actor, particularly in other intergovernmental forum, the EU has become what I would identify as an increasingly important orchestrator within the nuclear non-proliferation regime complex. Now, orchestration is a mode of soft and indirect governance. It's enacted when there is a collective action problem, particularly when there's multilateral stalemate and a lack of progress, which of course, for those of us who deal in nuclear, is a perpetual issue. Um, in such cases, the orchestrator Typically, it's associated with the role of an international organisation, but states are also um, attributed with the role. They lack certain capabilities to pursue more direct or hard modes of governance, so they enlist a like-minded intermediary, be that another international organisation, an agency or other non-state actor, to influence the behaviour of certain target actors in pursuit of shared goals. Now, I would suggest the EU has been doing this since the early 2000s, um, particularly, as a few of us have highlighted, few, few of the panelists have highlighted already, through its extensive financing of technical assistance and capacity building projects, implemented then by the CTBTO or the IAEA particularly. But also, it's relevant in terms of how the EU has financed and developed epistemic communities, such as this, <laughs> establishing an EU non-proliferation and disarmament consortium, which then is able to pursue additional activities. Now, orchestration as a soft and indirect mode of governance really enables the EU to draw on more of its unsung strengths. It's got very good, close personal relationships with other international organisations within the regime complex. It has a culture that favours effective multilateralism. It's in its DNA. Um, there is a consistent and broad-based consensus among all EU member states for strong and effective multilateral institutions. And the European External Action Service has a broad mandate under the 2003 WMD strategy for EU action, external action to, and I'm quoting, safeguard the centrality and promotion of the universality of the global non-proliferation and disarmament architecture. Now, what I, I think is important is that the EU's orchestration um, has moved on a little bit as well. Um, it's not just about technical assistance and capacity building, nor is it just about bringing on epistemic communities and research. And what I was really interested in, in fact, was um, the EU's orchestration of a series of regional and thematic consultative events that were convened by the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs as intermediary. Um, but we start to see, in, this was in Council Decision 2019-65, it was agreed in April 2019. It was deliberately intended to facilitate dialogue between practitioners, academia and civil society, and to initiate a roadmap for producing a successful outcome of the 10th MPT Review Conference. Now, the series of events was sadly disrupted by COVID. There was no roadmap that was worth was forthcoming and of course we all know what happened to the 10th MPT review conference but arguably I would say the series of consultations itself served an important deliberative function not least in providing an inclusive space to help MPT states parties to think beyond entrenched national positions so with EU member states divided they're divided by the very same political cleavages and contestations that hinder progress within the regime complex more generally. That council decision, I thought, really boosted EU visibility, but it also highlighted a pragmatic ability by the EU to actually flex its governance muscle 
through orchestration linked to convening practices. Now, I, I slightly skipped the second two questions, <coughs> but I, what the question was, how does the EU enhance its role? How does it position itself on prol proliferation issues in conflict regions? And I would say even here, orchestration holds an important key. In intergovernmental forums such as the MPT, but more broadly across the regime complex, including its various regional dimensions, the EU can only do so much. It has limited capabilities. It has, there are structural conditions and political cleavages that create and exacerbate transnational and regional governance problems. But those are the exact conditions that also allow it to take on an orchestration role. So I would say that as multilateral gridlock persists, and it will, arms control mechanisms disintegrate, new risks are emerging, that the EU could deliberately and almost strategically lean into orchestration as a mode of governance that it can do. And in doing that, I think there are three kind of key points to make. So first of all, for the EU to continue orchestration as a practice of technical assistance and capacity building for third countries, very much tailored to meet EU priorities. Now, these sort of, the sort of technical assistance projects don't tend to feature highly in the political spotlight, but they are a mainstay of the very practical steps that are needed to tackle non-proliferation challenges, reduce risk and build trust in an era of increasing mistrust and risk escalation. Secondly, I would say continue to advance orchestration as an epistemic practice. And that's not just so we can come back to conferences and, and listen to people, but because epistemic communities like this are essential for understanding the research, for undertaking the research necessary to understand and then address many of today's emerging risks. I would also say epistemic communities are really make an important contribution in terms of advancing track to diplomacy which I think is only going to become more important now than it has ever been, particularly in terms of engaging those countries where track one diplomacy has failed or is falling short. And final point, I would say advance, continue, advance orchestration as a convening practice about providing forums for deliberation. This should be geared towards initiating and unlocking the, unlocking the agency of other actors, in fact, to advance effective multilateralism. That is, I would say, take the lessons from that 2019 Council conclusion, build on it, try again. The EU can still make indirect and incremental impacts as an orchestrator that works through intermediaries to unblock stagnation, tackle more politically contentious issues, albeit from a distance, and start to advance solutions. Thank you very much. Well, I thought it was terrific, yeah. Indeed, indeed, I thought it was uh, outstanding. Uh, the EU as an orchestration power is a new concept, at least to me, and, and I thought you set out uh, beautifully what you meant with it um, and how, indeed, the complexity of the European Union can also be a source of strength, which was mentioned earlier, but you developed that thought um, further. So I think we've uh, heard uh, four brilliant presentations, but uh, we have, thankfully, uh, well, have a good, good, good half hour for uh, exchanges now with the audience. Um, I would like to take a few comments and then give the panelists, uh, all four of them, an, a chance to, to respond so we, we keep it uh, interactive uh, as possible. Um, all I would ask you is perhaps to introduce yourselves, um, who you are and what, you, what organization or whatever uh, you uh, represent. And I would st start here and then the lady over there and then one here and then we'll stop here, we'll take three and then uh, we'll have another round. There's a microphone that's coming uh, your way. We start here with a gentleman, and then, yes, please. Uh, my name is Carlo Trezza, I come from Rome. Uh, I'm an advisor to Instituto Affari Internazionali, Interalia. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the conclusion that I draw from, from this uh, interesting uh, debate is uh, that really the European Union needs a, a new strategy for non-proliferation and to include also disarmament as uh, the consortium has made, has already done. Uh, because really in 20 years, uh, we mentioned the fact that the present uh, strategy goes back to 2003, 
the, the world has changed completely. So uh, I believe that uh, one of the first thing to do is to consider this option. Uh, I have tens of uh, examples to make to, to, to prove that the world has changed. But just to, to, to say a few, uh, for in, uh, cyber security did not exist in 2003. Uh, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence what not, was not spoken about. Russia was uh, a partner of the European Union and today is uh, an adversary. And, uh, and so on and uh, so forth. So, so, so really I think that uh, uh, the time has come really to establish a new basis on which to work in order to face uh, the new reality. Just uh, the Budapest uh, memorandum was violated. I mean, uh, hunt, tens. So, so really, this is uh, the issue that I put to the attention of, uh, of the podium. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Loud and clear. We continue to my right. There's a lady. Yes, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everyone. My name is Federica Dallarche. I'm a senior research associate at the VCDMP, Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Thanks so much to the speakers for their perspective. Um, my question is uh, related to what um, some of the speakers have addressed and also uh, Borrell has said during his video. We are witnessing a Russia who is being more and more proactive in trying to de delegitimize the role and the credibility of the United of of the European Union, uh, both through uh, the legitimizing campaigns and use information campaigns, but also in multilateral fora. Uh, at the MPT and at other international meetings, uh, Russia has also questioned uh, even the role of the EU delivering statements uh, or even its participation. So my question is, what is the EU doing and what actually can the EU do uh, to counter this propaganda, which is actually very successful in shaping the mindset of third countries. That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Equally loud and clear. And then there was a lady over here. Uh, it was... There you are. Please. Hi, my name is Maaike Verbrugge from the Freie Universiteit Brussel. I have a question particularly for Dr. D, but I would love to hear everybody's opinion. Um, I was wondering, I understand that your, your topic of expertise is nuclear uh, disarmament, but I was wondering, do you see any sort of substantial qualitative differences of the rule in the EU for the conventional versus the nuclear world? Okay, let's, let's, let's start with this, if that's okay, and then we'll have another uh, round. Um, so we have a question on, should we have a new strategy for non-proliferation disarmament? World's changed so much. Uh, we have to take account political and, and technological and other changes. We have a question on Russia. Uh, its role in multilateral fora is disruptive and, 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 and other uh, qualifications that you can attach to it. And I will also be keen on how our non-European uh, friends see Russia's behavior. And we have a role on uh, a question on, on nuclear versus other non-proliferation threats and how you assess the EU's performance and behavior in this domain. We'll, we'll, we'll go a bit in the same uh, order as we did. And next time, maybe we'll swap it around. But we'll start with Carlos, please. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much. I mean, it was a very interesting questions. That's what makes these panels very special. A new strategy, uh, I mean, probably yes, but I mean, yes, uh, there's, uh, there's, as you mentioned, new technologies, new issues like cyber, artificial intelligence, the geopolitical changes with, uh, as a consequence of Russia's uh, aggression against Ukraine. Uh, so yeah, probably we could think of a new strategy to address all these topics. But at the same time, I think that the current strategy, even if it's 20 years old, uh, still has answers for these new threats. I mean, and that can be seen in the fact that uh, the EU and member states we are being very active in, I mean, some of the issues you have mentioned in cybersecurity. We are very active in uh, <clears throat> in artificial intelligence and, and its uh, implications for the military domain and so. So the fact that the strategy uh, actually established 20 years ago very broad guidelines gave us, it was mentioned, a very broad mandate to the AES. 
I think uh, it makes it still relevant. I mean, of course, it could go into more detail. It could try to address more specific issues. But um, I would say, I mean, even if I agree with you, I would say that could be a good idea. But uh, the strategy as it is, and in a way backed by other documents, as I mentioned, by the strategic compass and so, still puts a non-proliferation at the core of uh, EU policy. So even if it could help, sorry to, I mean, go back in circles, uh, I think it's still very re uh, relevant and valid, even if it's already 20 years old. Care to comment on Russia's behavior? Or? Yeah, I mean, happy to do that. <laughs> and so, I mean, for that, um, thank you very much for the, for the question. I think there's two, two issues there. I mean, first, if Russia is, as you rightly said, actively trying to delegitimize the European Union, is because it perceives that it has a weak point when dealing with the European Union. It has less, less legitimacy than the European Union, so that's why they try to attack the European Union, to try to show that our defense of multilateralism and so, um, to cast doubts on it and so, so. First, I mean, my first reaction would be they are trying to delegitimize us because we are doing the right thing and defending multilateralism and so. So the first reaction, that was your question, uh, how to counteract Russia's behavior is by insisting, insisting in our defense of effective multilateralism in supporting the existing system and working for its strengthening. I mean, that's the best thing we can do to, to set an example and uh, counteract this, uh, this propaganda. And also, I mean, you mentioned that it's very successful. And I, I would partly differ. I mean, I think it might not be as successful as we sometimes think. Uh, I don't know, we have had instances last week, for example, in The, in the Hague where they lost an election, basically. Uh, mm, there's been many instances where some voting today, I mean, this year in the first committee, where we were a little bit uh, probably over cautious, thinking that Russia will have much higher support than they actually did. So, I mean, that doesn't mean that we have to be complacent. I mean, we have to keep on, as I said, counteracting, but mainly by example, so in our support to the international system. and trusting in our capacities and trusting that, again, we are doing the right thing <coughs> and that people are actually seeing it. Thank you very much. I turn to uh, Carla May. Um, regarding the question of EU a new EU strategy or an updated one, um, I guess coming from someone who's inside of EU, I guess we could always support that. And if ever EU would like to put into certain strategies or certain cooperation they would have for other regions, it would depend on the dialogue and consultation that we have. Because I think the key to the relationship between the ASEAN and EU is open dialogue and consultation on the needs and the context, as well as what is um, what is their commitment under international law and what's possible under the domestic laws. So from that dialogue and discussion, you can have tailor-made capacity building activities so on and so forth. So as someone outside, I cannot tell like EU to make a new one, but we definitely would support if EU decides to make a new one. In terms of conventional weapons, we do have interactions with the EU on um, exploring regional cooperations and preventing the illicit trade of small arms and light weapons. And they're also exploring uh, data sharing in terms of uh, illicit trade. But these are things that uh, they're still moving on very slowly because of the variety of domestic contexts within Southeast Asia. Um, in terms of the question on Russia, I think for Southeast Asia, and I think for those who are familiar with the region, there is this strategic conundrum, I would say, that the, the, there is this strategic insecurity that we are in that geographic location, that we are surrounded in the broader Indo-Pacific of a lot of nuclear armed states. 
And those states in the region have a complex web of interests entangled with great powers. So for, for most of the Southeast Asian region, um, they try to adhere to this notion of having of freedom, neutrality, and peace. Um, some would say that we are a bit inclusive. We provide a platform, the ASEAN Regional Forum is one of the most inclusive platform that we invite the North Koreans, the Russians, and everywhere. We try to engage them, though we notice lately that they have been less to attend the meetings and less to engage with discussions. We try not to exclude, and this is actually very reflective and manifested in the ASEAN Indo-Pacific concept that we have. We prefer not to choose sides, which is sometimes being criticized as well because we're not choosing any sides. So this is the conundrum we have. In terms of nuclear risk, most of Southeast Asian states are signatories to the TPNW. So we tend to look at it, at we, to avoid nuclear risk, we tend to, to not to have nuclear weapons at all. So regardless of who owns the nuclear weapons, within the zone, Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, we don't we would not want nuclear weapon states to station or put in the region nuclear weapons. So that, that is me. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll narrow it down, which makes it easier for me on the first one, on the new strategy, by saying that's not the responsibility of the service I'm representing. Um, and it's uh, definitely... F uh, something to be looked at. And by the way, it helps if the outside asks for something so that yes. uh, in our decision-making process that can be accelerating things. I'll, on the other hand, be a bit broader uh, when it comes to the question of Russia and undermining the EU. I think, yes, they are, and we are working a lot. Our services is doing a lot there with some of the other instruments when it comes to disinformation, yeah. which has grown from something when I started working in Ukraine uh, eight years ago uh, and was a marginal issue to something that is mainstream, where we who are getting our requests for support measures very much from our ambassadors uh, on the ground, rather than this coming from a little bit the eastern neighborhood, this is coming from across the globe. There's hardly also an Asian ambassador, African, etc. nowadays, who doesn't have something on the wider disinformation front. Different actors, maybe not always Russian number one, um, but it is something that's present also in different formats, but it is something that is there. But when I said I will go broader, firstly, uh, secondly, the point we are also increasingly trying, and maybe we've been a bit naive, thinking that we are so nice guys, everybody has to love us. We try to talk a little bit more also about that um, and, and, and try to improve what we call public diplomacy. So also more proactively trying to make us and our stance on a number of issues known. Uh, we probably took a bit of that for too much too much for granted in the past. And thirdly, a very general point on the issue. This is not about Russia undermining the EU. If you look around in whichever multilateral context, in whichever treaty, convention, you give it whatever name, Russia has been undermining those for quite a number of years. And, and on that, I think that is the point which is important. And that's also maybe the point which we have to make a bit more forcefully, maybe stronger than other points, because all the people who, for example, think that Ukraine is a European problem, solve it, leave us alone with it, and then come back to normal business, yes, but Ukraine is just an indicator. We see, you see that it has been based on undermining values and treaties for a long time and has been accelerating, happening now in a num across the globe in a number of areas. And it's very important that I think everybody keeps that in mind. It's not the one article, it's not Russia against the EU, whatever that is the issue. We have this problem that we are having, and now it's not only Russia either. We are having a number of actors who are openly or less openly clearly undermining for a number of years already the multilateral uh, rules-based order. That is the problem. Uh, that's the basis of it. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much. And that's indeed not a problem only for the European Union. Um, I turn to uh, Megan Jane Dean, please. Like, sorry, that makes it's what my mother calls me when I'm in trouble, Megan Jane Dean. Um, <laughs> uh, so on the point of the... Of a, <laughs> sorry, yes. No, no. Yes. Um, of, a, of a new EU strategy. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of it. I just... Um, 
the, pra the pragmatist in me. It goes back to my point about the EU spending more time coordinating with itself than working with others. I think a new strategy creates that dilemma. And it has a strategy, it's working to a point, it's been reviewed, it's get, you know, implementation reports. So yes, maybe, but perhaps I wouldn't say now is necessarily the climate for it, but just because it distracts and it makes it all about the EU. Um, on Russia, um, I, actually I was in Vienna when Russia made the comment about the EU speaking rights. And I, I noticed there quite a few heads obviously popped up at that point, but I think they were all EU heads, they were all people from Europe. I don't think anyone else really kind of, they didn't really mean much. And I think that they, there's an element of the EU just sort of treating it like sticks and stones and get a thick skin and brush it off. I mean, that's just on the specifics of kind of Russian farce in these sorts of environments. Your question, which was excellent. Um, Thank you. The, um, so, I mean, obviously, orchestration is not new. Um, it's not new either to nuclear or anything. I mean, the EU has been orchestrating, in fact, in many different fields, crisis management, development policy, counter piracy measures. There are various pieces of scholarship out there that have engaged with these topics. In non-proliferation, um, there are many lessons that do cross over. So, of course, the EU is active in terms of technical assistance and capacity building projects. It's the same. It's exactly the same, it's mirrored across. I think where the differences lie is that there's more multilateral stalemate in the nuclear, which makes it more pressing and it, the necessity to diversify how that orchestration is being applied is probably more unique to nuclear than it is biological or chemical, I would say. Thank you. Okay, I think there's time for another round. I see a few more hands coming. Yes, one, two, three, four. I'm just making a quick inventory. Because um, in view of the time, maybe it starts to become wise to, maybe if there are further questions, maybe let's take them now and then give the panelists the final say. So if there are, let's, let's start with the, the questions that we have here in front. Please. My name is Sultania, uh, 40 years ambassador, multilateral ambassador, nuclear scientist. And now, of course, uh, president of Vienna International Institute for Middle East Studies, I speak in my personal capacity. I've been almost since this concession was established, working, participating, I congratulate you. And thank you now letting non-EU to criticize EU. I think this yes, is a good, good, a good thing. Therefore, I hope you will invite me late next time also. Yeah. <laughs> First, uh, as Ambassador said, Ambassador Carlo, my friend, Yes, you need to, rev uh, to re review a new strategy, not only just looking at the new technology, AI and other things. You have to review critically what you have done so far. The policy that EU has has not that much credibility in Global South because you have followed double standards, particularly on the issue of non-proliferation disarmament issue. While you strongly talk about NPT, which is 40 of my life, you totally ignore, put pressure on those outside of NPT, which recently the Minister of uh, Culture, not Minister of Defense, called using nuclear weapon against civilians. I didn't see any statement by EU, even the concession. For God's sakes, this is against any principle of non-proliferation. Who is what you're talking about? This, this should be reconsidered. The EU does not, and this credibility is reducing. But let me positive. The JCPOA was a manifestation of multilateralism, multilateral diplomacy, which EU was successfully done, but absolutely showing the weakness to protect it that this baby should be grown up. And always in the private meeting said, I'm sorry, we cannot do anything. If you cannot do it, anything, then you should not be interlocutor or push for any initiative that you cannot protect it. Let somebody else do it. And this was the experience that I had 20 years ago when EU3 came to uh, negotiate with us. And that was also a disaster. After two and a half years of suspension, additional protocol, EU said in a couple of weeks or months, uh, the issue is over in IEA. After two and a half years said, we are sorry, we are weak. If US is not there, we cannot do anything. Then we went and invited US and therefore five plus one, again the scenario. I don't, I'm sure that there won't be any third uh, experience for at least Iran to do it. I, I think it's stop here. 
Of course, whoever is interested to listen to the mouth of the horse, I will be available. Thank you. Thank you for your, your strong statements. We are all for democratic debates here, so this is, this is fine. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about the JCPOA as, and other elements, but we'll continue. There is, were more questions on this side. There's a gentleman here. There's a gentleman. I'm also looking at ladies. One, two, three, Marjolein van Delen. Okay, four, five. Okay, I will collect a few comments. We'll go this way, and then I'll ask my panelists to pick which si uh, elements. Uh, <laughs> please, sir, okay. the floor is yours. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Professor Dries Laraf from Morocco. Morocco. Uh, if, uh, if possible, I want to ask each question for uh, one question for each uh, panelist, starting from the starting from the left. Yes. Uh, for I think his name is uh, sorry Peter <laughs> Wagner. Uh, we take the opportunity here as he is the official of the European Union. Uh, I am wondering why the European Union you know, is is so absent, is is so um, amazing for the GCPU. Uh, by contrast to the beginning when it was active, it was the the pioneer uh, for fostering this GCPU. This is my question for Mr. Peter. For the Philippine panelists, I want to ask her, how can you explain that uh, Asia is the most mushroomy nuclear proliferation? It's in this continent where nuclear proliferation is the most rampant. And what has done exactly the European Union to stop that, to stay off that? Because if, uh, as we know, and personally I, I have I uh, prepared my PhD in Paris about nuclear proliferation. I have written a PhD of 2,300 pages, maybe <laughs> one, of, one of the singular PhD in the world, not only in Morocco. And I've studied very much, I've gone to England, to Britain. I know the terminology. Maybe I, I, I am alone here. I'm sorry, I am very modest, but I, I am very uh, glad to see that, that I, can, I know the terminology in Arabic, in English, and in French, yes. No problem. You can discuss with me. Uh, we will have my uh, email, and so we can exchange. OK. Uh, what has um, done exactly the European Union to, to stop, to stave off the nuclear proliferation? Because uh, as we know, uh, if we study the history of the nuclear proliferation uh, with uh, Taiwan, you know, the potential nuclear powers in Asia, uh, Taiwan, Japan, now Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, South Korea, North Korea, I think um, I think European Union has done nothing to stop. Uh, only the Americans, always the Americans, uh, yes. Uh, now my question to the, I think her name is Megan, yes. Uh, um, my question to the panelists, Megan, is how can you explain that? Um, how can you explain that the European Union will be efficient? Will be uh, um, what we can say? Will be uh, efficient to uh, to contribute to the uh, nuclear to the nuclear arms control and disarmament. Uh, and for the case, we know that uh, from the starting, from the, the starting of the nuclear uh, arms control and disarmament in 1969, under and, and the auspices of he, he, Henry Kissinger, who had just died, it was uh, uh, we have only always uh, the United States, uh, Soviet Union, and Russia, and at the end, a little bit England. Only the three actors who was, you know, um, uh, what you can say, who, who get involved in stopping nuclear proliferation? We we, we don't we don't see a European Union anywhere. Yeah. How can you explain this? And my last question is to the Spanish uh, panelist, uh, Carlos. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Professor. Uh, I, I am from Ambassador. Ambassador sorry, uh, Ambassador. So is. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's very good because we, I, we, we want to take the opportunity to know here, to know uh, much thing. It's especially his officials from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Office, the Spanish Foreign Office, um, and the specialists like me in nuclear proliferation. How can you explain that Spain, who was striving to build the bomb, you know, and uh, there is a statement, you can find it in, in the 
in the NATO uh, uh, journal. Uh, I have read it in French. I was in Paris. La revue de l'OTAN, maybe 83, 84, or where, where uh, in this statement, the, the Spanish colonel said, yes, we are striving to build the bomb and we will drop it on a country. I, I don't want to, to see the name of this country. But after Spain uh, stepped back, uh, stepped back, so I want to know who, who has exerted this influence. Is it the European Union, what we call it at the time? Say, oh, uh, Commission European, uh, Economic. Uh, Commission Economic. Economic. or is it the NATO, uh, United States, or another actor? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these critical questions. To your immediate neighbour, I will make a small plea to have precise and <laughs> concise questions, okay. just in view of the it's time. Really quick. Thank you. I want to hear more about the developments in the East and Northeast Asia, particularly the recent Russia and North Korea collaborations on the arms and technology control uh, exchange. And the ongoing political narratives around the U.S.-China competition that often leads to discussions of embracing nuclear buildup. How does that affect EU's non-proliferation in these armament efforts? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If you could pass on the microphone to Ambassador Van Dela. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene van Dalen, uh, Special Envoy for Non-Proliferation and Disarmament of the EU, and, and uh, having the honor with my team to implement many of these ideas, so I've been taking very, very good notes. Um, many of these ideas, and, and I'm, I'm especially thinking of the idea of the EU as a convening power, we can't do by ourselves. Um, we need partners for that. So uh, my question to the panel is, what type of partnerships would we be looking for? Uh, the, the one that you mentioned, Megan, on the MPT was a regional approach. The same is currently happening for the, in preparation of the review conference of the UN Programme of Action, small arms like weapons, so also on the conventional side. But should it be a regional approach? Should it be a light mind approach? Should it rather be looking at adversary positions and trying to unite those? Uh, should it be per topic? Uh, or should you look at the, the, a value-based approach? There's a lot of ways you could, one could approach that. And I'd be interested in the views. Thank you. Terrific question. Then the final question of the gentleman there on the far, my far left. And then we'll close the list. and. We'll ask uh, the panelists to respond. Please, sir. Thanks, and I will be brief. I'm joining you from Canada, and it's such a treat to be with you in Europe because our security conversations are obviously dominated by the U.S., and, I, and I, this was really a nice introspection for Europe. And so my question to you, we didn't really talk a lot about the U.S., nor did we talk about the prospect that Donald Trump could win the next election. And so I'm curious, if you cast your mind forward and suppose in this that Donald Trump does win the next election, to what degree would that change your comments? Does it make what you've said more important or less important? And how can Europe then rally? Because ultimately, um, I think he has a tenuous grasp on this, if I'm putting it charitably. Thank you. OK, well, terrific question. Really, um, I think we covered a lot of uh, ground. We'll get the full spectrum. Uh, the panelists are, will get the final word. They don't have to answer each and every point. But <laughs> it would be nice if they tried to address the questions that were put to them. And in, in the, as the moderator of a panel, I, I will make a plea for that to the extent possible. We'll start this time with, uh, with Megan, and we'll work our way back to, uh, to Carlos again. Yeah. Oh, I looked at I definitely drew yeah, the definitely. short straw there. Um, OK, thank you. Um, I'll start here um, on the point of how do you explain EU efficiency. I mean, I, I don't. Um, I, I mean, the, it, it's never going to be like the US, Russia, or China. I mean, there's no point trying. That's why I'm suggesting orchestration is necessary you need to work with partners you need to play to your weaknesses um, so I don't think the EU can ever get to that point other than short of being controversial here and saying we need a European you know Union of States United Union um, um, United Europe um, it's not it's not happening um, coming over um, here I thank you um, yeah I've been racking my brain on this one to try and think you know what's next what's next where are the next steps I mean obviously the EU has an extensive network already of implementing agencies or intermediaries um, that it could be working with in terms of the formats that it could be employing I mean I think the regional approach really was a success I think it was useful to bring in those perspectives not least in terms of bringing in voices that are all too often drowned out in the MPT um, but the EU has also already established in, an intermediary in terms of this. This is also an example of how the EU is able to create a new 
network that can actually um, orchestrate, that it can um, act for it. Um, so it's possible then to start to think about, okay, so who, yeah, rather than if you don't have a partner, make one. <laughs> There is also, and I will just say this as a sideline, there's the other approach, which is where I think minilateralism is the way that things are progressing in the regime complex. I think even when you think about the high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism, it's talking about the necessity to be, to be flexible and networked and to work and where subgroups of states are going to be increasingly more, more important in the process. And I wonder if the EU needs to start really connecting out with the different subgroups that are already in existence within the regime complex. It, you already have the links because your member states are part of these groups, like the NPDI, the New Agenda Coalition. These groups are there, they're existing. So actually use your member states and connect up with those subgroupings and on a sort of almost on a bilat level with individual groups. I, yeah, that's one, I, that'd be quite a fun way through, but that's, that's again, an academic pursuit. I appreciate your, you have to actually implement it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm done. Yeah, Sorry. thank you very much. We'll give Peter a chance to make his final comment. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, to which one to concentrate, okay. Yeah. Um, let's put the question a little bit, which, which is coming into the same uh, kind of direction. That's a question of um, multilateralism, double standards, uh, why are we absent, why are we slow? Well, that is what I said at the very beginning. That is our weakness, which I admit it up front. We are many, and we have to bring everybody along, and that often takes a moment. So that's something that the EU usually has never been trying to hide, uh, because as I said, it's part of our working method. Maybe I should have mentioned, and that your question brought that to the forefront, that we are indeed having another problem, but I think many are having that, and that is our ability to deal with many problems at the same time, and with many challenges and threats. And we are currently in a situation where similar questions we are getting nearly every day. Um, one which I had over the weekend was uh, what is what was going on, is going on, Armenia, Azerbaijan, would have kept all of Brussels busy and agitated, etc., uh, 18 months ago, and everybody, a bit more than, let's say, two years ago, and everybody would have been busy with it. Nowadays, you have problem to even get enough specialists around the table to look at such a, such a crucial question. On the other hand, and that's what I would like to say in our favor, and didn't mention that as one of our strengths, we are a big tanker, it takes a while to redirect us. But once we are on the course, we are usually one of the most reliable, most stable partners in doing so, and that's the upside to that other downside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, I just wanted to answer the question, what is EU doing to address nuclear proliferation in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific? I, I just wanted to give a context that in the broader Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, as some would use it, is that there is no regional security architecture. If EU wants to engage with individual states, engage with proliferation or nuclear armed states, they might have to do it bilaterally. So that will be, example, EU-India, EU-Pakistan. And depending on the varied interest of EU then, and I cannot speak for EU in that matter, that will be the actions they would have to take. In Southeast Asia, it becomes easier because we have a security architecture, which is ASEAN. So through the ASEAN, EU is able to provide targeted regional frameworks that would help uh, address issues of peripheration, or provide technical, uh, provide capacity building, or provide information, or make them understand that maybe these are things that you should probably avoid because you're mm -hmm. crossing there. So that is the difficulty. And in terms as well of the DPRK, I know EU has been very active in, um, in the sanctions. However, it would be a broader conversation whether actually the sanctions, even UN Security Council sanctions, are actually working to stop the aspirations of the DPRK. 
as we had now know that it has even codified in its uh, constitutions like use of targeting in case it is being uh, it seems that it is being threatened by other states. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Final uh, comments from Carlos. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, the good part now has been the last one to uh, reply is like, uh, can't really agree what has been said. And so uh, I think the U.S. still has a very strong role to play in non-proliferation. Maybe efficiency is uh, not our strength, but uh, reliability is. Uh, sometimes it takes more time, but still we, we strive. Who should we... How should we develop partnerships? That's a difficult one. And so I think uh, it will be the process of the next uh, few months between uh, you, member states, and so. So it's good that we have some feedback from academia. And not much more. I mean, it's like just um, very, in spite of the difficult circumstances, I'm very optimistic about the role that the EU can play in non-proliferation and the strong support it gives. And just like, obviously, very basic at the end, uh, Spain joined the NPT many years ago, has been a non-nuclear non -nuclear weapon state from the beginning. So, yeah, I mean, that's a quite clear and straightforward answer. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks very much to, uh, to my panelists, which I thought was really uh, a stellar way of opening uh, this, uh, this conference. Of course, the deliberations continue. Um, we'll have a keynote address uh, next. But please join me in thanking my uh, panelists. Uh